All right. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Verbeure. I uh, work for NVIDIA, where I uh, design ASICs and FPGAs. And um, during the day and in the evening, I go to my garage and I do more stuff with FPGAs. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can repurpose uh, commercial FPGA-based products and um, use them as a development kit. Um, so basically, if I say here obsolete, they're not necessarily all obsolete, but, but basically if you look at um, FPGAs, they're typically still pretty expensive for the capacity. Um, in an earlier talk, uh, I believe Jeff mentioned an Arduino um, as an example, which uses an um, IS-40 um, FPGA from Lattice. Um, that board is $20, but these, these FPGAs are still very small. We're talking here like 5K. Now, 5K logic elements is, is, is not too bad. Um, you can put a small uh, CPU in there if you want to, um, but it's not, it's not great if you want to go a little bit bigger. And the, the moment you go for um, FPGAs with, let's say, 40,000 or, or 100,000 logic elements, uh, development kits get, get quite expensive. I mean, at, at least, you know, $100 or, uh, or more. So um, um, on the contrary, um, Commercial products, they can get FPGAs uh, really cheap. I mean, there's a, there's a huge high volume discount for um, for these products. Um, so commercial products um, are often, I mean, the whole product is often much cheaper than what you can get for the FPGA um, as a as a raw product. Um, and then you basically get a much higher bang for buck, uh, much higher FPGA capacity. Um, these commercial products also have um, often very special components and features. Um, and then another very, very big uh, pro is uh, just the satisfaction of hacking. Uh, there is a bunch of enthusiasts out there who do nothing but basically find commercial products with an FPGA and then reverse engineer it, show it to the world, and then they probably move on to the, to, to the next one. Um, the negatives are, you know, there may be ugly hacks required. It's, it's often not that easy to, to bend the um, commercial board to your will. Some of the reverse engineering can be quite tedious, although it's kind of soothing in, in, in some kind of way often. Um, lack of generic GPIOs is a big thing. Um, you know, if the board doesn't provide um, the exact IO that you need, um, it's often very hard to, um, to make that happen. And of course, there's little or no support online. So um, you're, you're really on your own. Um, for example, uh, on the Panologic uh, board, you know, it, it, it acts as a little PC. I'll show you that uh, in, in a moment. And there are no GPIOs, so basically you have to, I had to resort to using the I2C interface of an HDMI or a VGA port as a, as a general purpose um, I.O. port. So here, here are a bunch of examples um, of these kind of boards. The, the ones I've done the most work on are the Panologic G1 and G2. They're basically obsolete FPGA um, only thin clients. Their, their marketing claim was that you would have um, a central server and you would have um, a, um, a thin client without a, a CPU, and as a result, there wouldn't be any risk for uh, running into viruses. Um, and so the, these, these boxes back in the day were pretty expensive. I mean, they were hundred, hundreds of um, hundreds of dollars, but the company went under. So now you can find these things for um, for very cheap. I mean, I, back in the day, I was able to buy twenty five of those for seventy five dollars. Prices have, have gone up uh, a little bit since, um, but you can still find it for like twenty dollars on on eBay. Uh, and they have really large FPGAs. The G1 has a Spartan E3-1500. Uh, um, I forgot, that's something like 30,000 logic elements. The Spartan, the G2 has an LX150 or an LX100. That's 150,000 logic elements, which is really astonishing. Um, and they have like all the, the necessary um, components to make um, a PC-like uh, thing. Um, I mean, in, in, uh, my dream is still to make these things work and, and run Mister on it because it would be like the perfect platform. Uh, they also have a, an easily accessible JTAG port. I, I talk about that later. Um, a very popular one, or a one that has gained quite a lot of prominence recently, is the Colorlight 5A75B. It's used to drive um, LED matrices. And, and one of the, the nice things about it is it's probably the best platform to use if you want to uh, stick to an open source uh, tool because it uses the, um, a pretty large 25K EPC5 um, Lattice FPGA that's supported by Yosis and XPNR. It has uh, two gigabit inter interfaces, a gigabit Ethernet interfaces, DRAM, lots of output pins, no input pins. It also has an easily accessible JTAG port, and it's it's not an obsolete product. I mean, you can buy it today on, for $15 on AliExpress. The, one of the boards I worked on first was the EE Color Color 3. They're now pretty hard to find. They're still of $20 on Amazon. Um, they have HDMI in, HDMI out, a pretty large 30K logic element Cyclone 4. 
And so this board is, is really great if you want to get video in, do some processing on it and, and drive video out. <clears throat> um, I have here the RV901T. It's, it's uh, similar to the color light, similar kind of product, but um, it's not that important anymore because I think the color light is just better, better by nature of having more uh, logic elements and um, an open source uh, tool. This is something I've been working on lately, which is um, a PCIe board uh, with a huge FPGA. Um, the, the goal here is to um, to get the first um, you know board that has an, um, that that is plug pluggable into a, a regular PCIe slot. Um, somebody, I mean, we've been able to get an LED blinking, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do. This is a very tough board to re reverse engineer. And then one of my favorites is the Cisco um, HWIC 3G CDMA modem. Um, it's an obsolete Cisco One card. Um, basically, you would plug it into a router and then give it the WAN um, capabilities. Pretty large FPGA, uh, has SD RAM, an RS232 interface, flash that's unpopulated, but that's easy to solder. Um, and very important, lots of GPIOs. And most important, they're only $8 on eBay. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great um, uh, board. So now um, let's talk a bit about how you get um, these boards to, to, to work. Um, there's, there's multiple steps in the, in the whole process. I mean, one of the really important steps is just gathering the information, product data sheets, identifying all the components, um, the component data sheets. Um, sometimes you can find schematics online. And then uh, there's other reverse engineering enthusiasts who basically have already done some, some work for you. Then the second step is getting the JDA up and running. Um, JDA is the stands for Joint Test Action Group, and it's basically it's a, um, a spec for testing joints on a PCB. Uh, on a PCB, so um, into in, uh, at least that was how it originally was uh, devised, but it's currently used much more uh, for um, as a very low uh, pin interface. It's only four pins minimum, um, and to basically uh, connect the debuggers, um, do um, uh, test vector testing and stuff like that. Um, and they're essential to program FPGAs. It's how you basically configure the FPGA with a bitstream um, and, and configure the internal logic. Um, then there is the interconnection discovery. There is a whole bunch of ways you can do that, and I'll talk about it later. Uh, then very important is getting a, a blinking LED. It's, it's the hello world of FPGA board reverse engineering. And then you bring up the, the peripherals if, if, um, if there are any interesting ones. And finally, document everything. This is not something that happens a lot. I, I try to be very... Um, rigorous about it. I pretty much every note that, that I take, I put it in markdown files and put it in GitHub re, um, repositories so that uh, other people can find it. So now let's get a little bit more in, into detail. So here, for example, the, um, that, FP, that uh, PCIe board, uh, you basically start by getting, for example, here you see the, um, uh, the footprints of, the, of the, the main FPGA and of the CPLD that is used to configure that FPGA. Um, those are things you can get either from the software or from data sheets. Another thing is you, you take a lot of very uh, detailed, um, high resolution pictures like the, the one at, at the top, and then you start identifying as much as you can um, the pins um, that, that might be important. For example, there at the top right, you see the TDI and TMS. Those are pins um, that carry um, the, the JTAG interface. Um, and this, this can be quite a bit of work just you know, trying to figure out exactly um, which which piece of copper is connected to to which pin. Um, and then uh, the next step is finding the the JTAG connectors. Um, since FPGAs uh, need to be configured um, most often by um, a flash, what happens in production? The the, the most convenient way of, of dealing with that is first assembling the whole board with an empty flash and then programming it on the production line, which means there must be easily accessible test points to um, talk to that FPGA connector. And, and here you can see some of those boards that I've used. Um, they all have a fairly obvious way to, to um, connect the, the JDAG connector. Um, the RV901T at the bottom there, there's a, a case where that's not, not true. So there you need to do some, some really accurate um, soldering to, um, to some test points in order to, to get that uh, interface out. And it, it, that can be a, um, a bit of a hassle. So I, I try to avoid boards that, that require this kind of stuff because other people are not going to be using it either. Um, and then there's a JTAG bring up. So um, JTAG can um, daisy chain multiple chips together. Now, the vast majority of the cases, there is really only one chip that's controlled by the JTAG and that is the FPGA. Um, I often use OpenOCD um, for um, JTAG for the discovery of the, the, the JTAG interface. 
Um, but commercial tools like here, you see um, Intel Quartus tool, um, when they can sometimes be, be easier. Again, here you see that PCIe board, which has four chips in the JTAG chain. First, um, the configuration uh, chip, the, it, which is a Max 2 CPLD. Then the main FPGA, the, um, it's, uh, the Aria GX90. And then you have two other chips, and those are the, um, the GZIP accelerator chips that are basically the main function of that board. Um, um, having multiple chips on a chain is, is um, a problem sometimes because it, it makes some tools harder to, to work with. Uh, for example, on this particular board, um, when um, the, the board goes into low power mode, it shuts down the, po the power to those two um, accelerator chips. And as a result of the JTAG chain breaks. And when the JTAG chain breaks, it basically means you, you can't do anything anymore. So uh, a workaround then is to find on the PCB the exact uh, uh, wire that goes from the FPGA to that um, third chip. And basically you tap off the, the pin there and then route that back to your JTAG um, controller instead of um, at the end of the chain. And that and so when the power then switches down for those two chips, that um, you can still control um, the, the FPGA um, itself. Uh, and then comes the, the, the part of finding all the connections between the chip. The, the, one of a, a very common way, of course, is just ohming out everything. Um, it's, it's as tedious as it sounds, right? You, for example, on the board on the on the right, I wasn't really using um, JDAC at that time a whole lot. It really comes down to, you know, you, you see all these pins at uh, these chips on the left and the right. Those are the HGMI, uh, HGMI decoder and encoder. You put your um, pr your probe, your multimeter on one of those tiny pins. They're spaced uh, half a millimeter from each other. And then you try to see how, uh, to which pin, um, uh, to which ball out of the, um, to which ball of the FPGA is that connected. And you just, you know, go through all of them. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of time. Um, ohming out doesn't, doesn't always work that well as, uh, when there are uh, resistors or especially capacitors between two pins, then your, um, your multimeter won't basically trigger. Um, that doesn't happen a whole lot, but sometimes it does, and it's it's very annoying. Um, and, and another very common way, um, although I haven't done it, um, is to de-layer um, the PCB. PCBs are often four to six layers or more. Um, if you first uh, desolder all the components with a hot air rework station, and then you can use sanding, and you just start sanding away each layer individually, take pictures, uh, post process it in, in Photoshop and then overlay those multiple layers and then you can figure out how pins are connected one uh, one to the next. Again, I, I've, I've never really had the need to do it, although I'm, I'm, I might have to do it with the, that PCIe board because that's that's a very complex one. Um, this is a really interesting technique here. So um, since JDAC is, is designed for um, observability of IO pads and, and, and debug features inside the chip, one of the main things that it was initially designed for is um, every chip has a, um, a shift register around all the IO pads of a chip. And you can um, either capture or control uh, what inputs, outputs, uh, pins are doing. Now, when you're in capture mode, what you can really do, you can put the board in a live system. And here you see that PCIe board plugged into a very old uh, Mac Pro that isn't used for anything else. So you, I just plug that in. The board basically powers up. Um, then you can see my um, my JDAC controller connected to that board. And so while the the, the, the PC is the, while that board is up and running and being functional, I can issue issue JDAC commands to capture the value of all the I/O pins of that FPGA. Um, and there's the, um, there is something like two thousand. Um, um, uh, elements in that shift register because it contains an input and output and output enable. Um, and then you can download from the manufacturer website the BSDL file. It's a boundary scan description language which contains for all the IO pads um, which element in the scan chain has what functionality. For example, you know, pin number or, or um, flip flop number 100 in that scan register um, contains the captured value of pin AA56, something like that. And so what you can do then is with open OCD, I can capture, let's say, 20 um, capture points uh, just at the random. You know, you capture the value and, and you store it in a file. And then uh, you can correlate. Um, you, you can then write a script or there are also commercial tools for that. But I, I wrote my own script in this case. And then you can basically start um, 
um, decompiling that those 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 traces and see exactly in in a temporal way what happens. And I'll I'll, I'll I show that here. So here you see the trace, a truncated trace of all those values um, that came out of the scan chain. So you know here I have four four captures. And you know um, some pins are not used and they will never toggle. Some uh, pins are input, some pins are output. There might be a clock, there might be a functional thing, and that's something you can then um, derive from from a thing. So at the bottom you see that my post processing processing script. You know there's pins like here first Y9 for example. I don't know what it does. It's a constant input. Um, then for example you see there pin L2, which is an uh, an input. I figured out that this was a clock um, because it's constantly toggling. I mean you see. Uh, zero one 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 zero. It's not like zero one zero one zero zero one zero. That's basically because I'm just randomly capturing. Um, but you know, it's very good information to figure out that hey, this is very likely a clock. Um, then I was able to identify, for example, that pin A four, um, you know, is a, a, a clock that goes to the SD RAM, and so and, and so forth. So this is this is really useful information. Just knowing which pins are input and which pins. Um, our output, and, and I have a link here to that tool if you if you feel like using it. Um, and then there's there's another um, technique which which is what I uh, what I call a clothes um, transmitting UART technique. So Claude Schwartz is another enthusiast who has done a lot of uh, FPGA re, uh, reverse engineering. What he does, he creates a bit stream for an FPGA that contains as many uh, transmitting UARTs as there are um, I/O pads. And then each UART will basically constantly transmit a unique number. Um, and so, you know, it gets basically assigned. I mean, you, you synthesize it, you load it into the FPGA. And then if you have an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer that has UART decoding functionality, you can just take your oscilloscope and start probing on points of interest and see um, if, your oscilloscope, if, if there is activity there. And if so, then the, the UR decode functionality can basically list right away on the scope. This is pin number uh, 110. And so now you've made a connection from the FPGA to that point of interest on the PCB, and you've discovered more information. Um, there, is a, there is a little caveat here. I mean, if you, would, if you do that on FPGA, when uh, the FPGA um, is supposed to be on the board and uh, to, to be an input, um, but of course, now obviously you are using as an output. Then you might have basically two uh, two chips driving against the, each other. The FPGA is driving, the um, the other chip on the board is driving, and that might damage the FPGA. But then with um, the technique that I mentioned earlier, where you use the boundary scan to figure out the in, which pin is an input and which pin is an output, you can then basically say, well, I'm only going to use clothes uh, technique. Um, for those pins that, for which I'm sure that they're basically configured as, a, as an output. Um, and so as you keep on doing this, eventually you get to the, the point where you're, um, you figure out, you know, how is an FPGA connected to an LED? And then um, again, the hello world is the, the blinking LED. Um, and you, you can't see it here, but, uh, but you just have to believe me that those LEDs at the top of the PCB, they're, they're really actually blinking. Okay. so. Um, another problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that some of these FPGA boards, uh, they're designed for one specific function, right? Um, here at the bottom left, again, is the color light uh, 5A75B. Uh, um, and all those connectors you see there are used to drive um, LED panels. So they're all outputs. Well, um, what if you need inputs? Well, that, that board hasn't been designed for that. Um, so, um, but what you can do is you, the, you see those... those um, those chips, um, these rows of chips at the top and at the bottom, those are driver level shifters that convert convert from a 3.3 volt to a 5 volt that is required for the LEDs, and those are um, output only level shifters. Well, what you can do is you could desolder those chips, and then you could manually solder the inputs straight to the outputs, and now you have a general purpose um, GPIO. Um, or you could do better; you could design a tiny little PCB that that does nothing. Um, but um, uh, fit right on the footprint of those uh, driver chips and just solder those. And now you've converted your um, your very cheap $15 board um, to a still very cheap general purpose uh, board that has hundreds of, um, or maybe 50 or yeah, maybe a hundred um, uh, GPIOs. Um, I think it's important to mention here also, if, if people don't know it yet, making PCBs these days is incredibly cheap. 
Um, I don't know what the prices are right now, but last year you could produce um, a two-layer PCB, um, a GLC PCB for two dollars. I think the price is now around five dollars, and and that's five dollars in, in return you get five or ten PCBs. The shipping is another five dollars. So for less than ten dollars, you can make very high quality uh, PCBs um, as, as as a hobbyist. And um, so yeah, that, that's that's really it's a, it's a very attractive um, option. And so this part, board in particular, I believe um, that uh, people have been able to run to to install Linux on it and and yeah, make it uh, I mean connected to the network uh, through the, the the gigabit Ethernet, etc. Um, here's another very good example of that. So the Cisco board that I mentioned earlier uh, is uh, needs to be plugged in into a um, Cisco router. And it does that via um, a Cisco specific um, HWIC connector. The HWIC connector has um, a bunch of um, standard 0.1 mm, um, uh, inch uh, pins, but most of them are actually have that. They're uh, 0.25 inch. So it's, it's a very fine, a very um, subtle um, um, interface. It's very hard to use in general. But what I designed here is a little board that um, the, the bottom two rows are pins that plug straight into that connector. And then on the, that co it gets converted to a general purpose uh, GPIO interface with the regular 0 0.1 pin header format. Um, this board does another thing. Cisco is, is kind of a, a special case in that they don't have configuration flash on their boards itself, itself because the, the, um, at boot up, the router will send the bitstream um, through to, to that modem um, on the fly. And this has the benefit that you can um, update the um, FPGA bitstream or, or firmware um, with um, when you update the operating system of your um, of your router, which allows you to fix bugs if, if necessary or even change protocols. Um, that's the, the problem with that, of course, is that um, you cannot use that board standalone. You will also always have to program that board one way or the other. Well, this particular board uh, contains a tiny, uh, what is called a uh, an AT tiny. And, an, um, and a flash, um, which allows you that um, you know, which, which will allow you eventually to configure the, the bitstream without needing a Cisco router or a JTAG interface to configure the FPGA. That that's still work in progress. I've, I've used this board as a GPIO board, but I haven't gotten to the point yet where I can can configure the the board. Uh, and and here are then some some examples, right? So um, here you see that that very Cisco board. Um, it's it's driving my uh, my LED cube. Um, you can see at the bottom right, um, that's the, the little um, adapter board that I designed to connect that modem to, um, to the LED cube. Um, here's another example um, of the EE Color, uh, Color 3. So on the left, you see an NVIDIA Shield uh, console. Um, on the right, you see um, a, a monitor. What you can't see here, but you, you just have to take my word for it, is that um, the, the, the Color 3 basically takes in the, um, the HDMI data from the, the, the NVIDIA Shield, and then actually does an overlay. There's a little rectangle moving around. I, I change some red colors to green at some point, and then send it out again. So if you if you want to make your own real-time um, subtitling machine, this is something you could do. Um, and, and another interesting thing here is to notice that the, the, the two chips on this board that are used to decode and to encode the HDMI thing, um, their data sheets don't mention how they need to be programmed. Um, but they get programmed via I2C. So in, in order to, to configure those chips, and, and if you don't have the program, well, what do you do? Well, it, it, it's actually pretty simple. What you, you do is you solder two wires to those pins that are uh, 0 0.5 millimeters uh, spaced aside. Um, and then you just record them with a, with a logic analyzer. All the transactions, you decode all those transactions to I2C uh, commands. You strip all the, the things that you think are not necessary, and then on, on your um, on your own uh, design, you just replay those I square C transactions, and you know the chips get configured exactly the way you want. And so that's a, that, that's um, that's what I've done in in this particular case. Um, here's another another um, uh, project that I did on the the Panologic G1. Um, so um, it, it has everything, right? It has a USB Ethernet uh, VGA output. A uh, pretty large interface, and so I, I decided to make a demo where I, I do a real-time uh, racing the beam ray tracer, uh, where the um, where you calculate one uh, pixel per clock cycle and send it straight uh, to VGA. So th this thing doesn't even need memory. It's it's um, um, all the um, all the math is, is synthesized as as completely unrolled 
mathematical instructions synthesized into the FPGA and um, and then yeah um, I mean this this is this is completely useless in practice. Um, if I would add one additional geomet geometric uh, shape to that, the, the FPGA would crash and and it, it wouldn't fit. Um, but it was a, it was a very fun uh, proof of concept that that shows what you can do with this kind of um, devices. And um, and that's basically it. Um, I I really love talking about this stuff. Um, I have a lot of articles on my blog about this. Um, send me a direct message on Twitter if you're interested. And uh, thank you. <laughs>